So who said this? I have much more humility than a lot of people would think. Okay, was it A, I have a lot more humility than a lot of people would think. Who said that? Was it A, Nelson Mandela? Was it B, Vladimir Putin? Was it C, Barack Obama? Or was it D, Donald Trump? Okay, so who's going to go for A? Who's going to go for Nelson Mandela? Who said, who said, I have a lot more humility than people would think? Nelson says, if people go Nelson Mandela, who's going to go Putin? Who thinks Vladimir Putin says, I have a much more humility than a lot of people would think? No one's going to go Putin? Okay. Anyone going to go for Barack Obama? Anyone's going to think Obama said that? Okay, so anyone going to go for Donald Trump? Who thinks that Donald Trump? Okay, there seems to be a bit of a, bit of a, a sort of a, a sense that that's maybe something that Trump might say. Well, the answer, perhaps surprisingly, is... D, it was actually Donald Trump. Yes, Donald Trump claimed in an interview that he had much more humility than a lot of people would think. But he doesn't show it because he wants to be unpredictable. Um, he claims to be a modest person. Maybe he was the person who won a badge for humility, but then they took it away because he wore it. Um, now, Donald Trump has many qualities. <laughs> maybe, maybe, just maybe. Humility is not among those, the most obvious ones, perhaps. But we do like humble leaders. Maybe it's one of the reasons that Donald Trump is not so popular, because humility is prized. In fact, one online commentator claimed that humility is the most important virtue in life. This author then listed 10 world leaders who showed that humility is all that matters. Okay, so who do you think was number one on this list that this author thought um, was the number most hum humble world leader? Well, perhaps surprisingly, uh, it might be unsurprisingly to him, but it was, sorry, surprisingly to him, it wasn't Donald Trump. Uh, whilst he didn't make the list, I'm sure Trump probably thought he should have been on the list, but he wasn't. But the number one most humble leader was former US President Barack Obama, who helped fo serve food um, during, sorry, food, food for the homeless during Thanksgiving. Number two on the list was Jose Pepe Mujica, Mujica, sorry, the former president of Uruguay. Now he was dubbed the world's poorest president and was known to have donated 90% of his income, his presidential salary, to charity. And he lived on a farm instead of a lavish presidential palace. And in fact, in one year, the only personal asset that he owned was a 1987 Volkswagen Beetle valued at less than $2,000. Well, number three on the list was Joyce Banda, the president, uh, former president of Malawi, who sold off the presidential jet and a fleet of 60 Mercedes limousines to help her country's failing econ economy. But then what about Nelson Mandela? He wasn't actually on that list, but Oprah Winfrey claimed that he was the most humble person that she had ever met. In fact, one time he was going to appear on the Oprah Winfrey show, Mandela arrived and spoke to the producer and said, so what is the subject of today's show? And the producer then said, well, um, uh, Ms. Nelson Mandela, you are the subject of today's show. And Oprah was deeply impressed with his humility. So who do you think then is the world's most humble leader? Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela. Donald Trump. Well, in this passage before us this morning, we learn about the ultimate example of humility. From the most humble leader the world has ever seen. Someone who had far more privilege, wealth and entitlement than the greatest president. But someone who gave up this privilege to perform the lowest of low actions. Far more demeaning than serving the homeless or driving a beetle. This person, in fact, changed the world so much that today we value humility as the most important virtue in life. And we read about this person, Jesus, Jesus Christ, in this mighty passage in Philippians chapter 2. And from his example, we're inspired by him and encouraged to imitate him and be humble. 
Now, Paul starts this little section by continuing what we looked at last week. And thematically and logically, this section is connected to the ideas that Paul was sharing in chapter 1, verse 27 through to 2, 4, about living lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, we didn't cover verses 5 to 11 last week because I thought that this passage of Scripture is so magnificent that it'd be worthwhile just reflecting on its own um, this week. And so if we cast our eyes back to what Paul was saying in chapter 127 to 2, 4, we learned that the Philippians had been encountering suffering for their faith. Now, we're not exactly sure what this suffering was, but they were encountering opposition for believing in Jesus. And hence, Paul encourages them to, to stand and to live lives worthy of the gospel, of, worthy of being a citizen of Christ. So Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And living as a worthy citizen of Christ means they should stand for Jesus. But they're also to draw on their union with Christ, his love and his spirit. And they should live like Jesus, which means being humble. So verses 3 to 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, consider value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. They are to be humble and to look for the interests of others above their own. Now it's remarkable in some sense that humility is the central virtue of the life worthy of a citizen of the gospel. Because in the ancient world, humility was not a virtue. Ancient historian Edwin Judge said that humility in Greek and Roman ethics would be a degrading thing. To put yourself down to a level that you were not born to or that your standing in life did not require you to be in was disgraceful and debasing. Humility was associated with failure and shame. There was no virtue in it at all. Indeed, modern philosopher Alistair MacIntyre once said, Aristotle would certainly not have admired Jesus Christ and he would have been horrified by St Paul. Why? Because of their view of humility. And perhaps controversially, but the primary reason, or maybe the only reason, that we value humility today is because of the example and the humility of Jesus. The ultimate example of humility, which as Paul says in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Believers should live like their master, live like Christ. Yet they should not just be humble, they are to have the attitude and the mind of humility, imitating the attitude and the mind of Christ. Be so disposed to one another as, a, as is proper for those who are united in Christ. Humility is to permeate everything a believer does as they are inspired by, emulate and imitate Christ Jesus. But what was it about Jesus that made him so humble? What had he done that made the world, which, which, which had changed the world's view on humility? Well, Paul then goes on to explain why Christ was so humble. And in doing so, we see the ultimate example of humility that the world has ever seen. Now, as I said earlier, Donald Trump claims to be humble, but his actions don't really match the claim. In fact, a search of Trump's Twitter feed um, turns up more than 1,200 mentions of the words biggest, best and smartest. He has called himself a very stable genius, has claimed that he has a gorgeous physique and has asserted that there's never been a president like President Trump. Now, these statements don't seem terribly consistent with a genuinely humble person. Maybe, do you think, maybe you disagree, but uh, I'm, I'm not so persuaded. Because humility is demonstrated by action. You can't just claim to be humble. Humility is defined through actions. So notice that each of the descriptions of the humble leaders I outlined earlier were accompanied with illustrations for why they were so humble. Barack Obama was humble because he served food to the homeless on Thanksgiving. He did something that was not in the job description of a president, doing a task many would consider beneath his office. Jose Pepe Mujica gave up the large salary and the wealth of being a president and owned just a simple car. 
His humility was demonstrated by his actions. As were those of Joyce Banda, who gave up the luxury of a Mercedes vehicles and a private jet to fly on ordinary commercial airlines instead. All of these humble people had gone from somewhere lofty, giving up privilege and prestige and entitlement to embrace something more lowly, something less privileged. Yet the most extreme example of humility ever seen is in the passage before us. This section, verses 6 to 11, has often been claimed as an early hymn due to its rhythmic nature. But it's more like poetic prose, a form of praise to a mighty figure. And Paul uses this poem to demonstrate exactly how humble Jesus is. And so we can see just at the start of the poem just how high were the lofty heights from which Jesus came. Look there in verse 6. Jesus said, who being in the very nature God. Who being in very nature God. I'm not sure you can get any higher, loftier or greater than the creator of the universe. Jesus is not just a great man or even a semi-divine figure. or He is in his very nature God. The supreme being of the universe. Now there's a lot of debate about what is meant here, particularly concerning the word nature, or as you can see in the footnote there, form of God. What does it mean that Jesus was in the form of God? Does this mean form as in simply outward appearance, as though Jesus was wearing a God costume? You know, he looked like God or a divine heavenly being, but in his essence, in his internally, he wasn't really God. Now, in this view, in the form, being in the form of God meant Jesus was something distinct from God himself and he wasn't really God incarnate. Well, does the term in the form of God actually mean something to do with Jesus' inward reality, his essence? Jesus wasn't just putting on a God costume, he really was God in himself. So whatever that God ingredient was, then Jesus had it. Now, as I said, this has been furiously debated and there's lots and lots of books on this. But I think that Paul means that Jesus is God in his internal essence. He wasn't just putting on a costume, he really was God. For when other ancient authors used the term form of God, they meant it to comprise certain internal virtues, a way of being, not simply the external or the outward appearance. And it's the same idea here. Jesus is not just a a heavenly being or some kind of with some kind of divine appearance. Jesus in the form of God means that Jesus represents the divine being. He is the visible expression of God's glorious self. So this really is quite an astonishing statement. But even more astonishing is who wrote this. Because this was written by a first century Jew. And Jews were firmly, strongly, stridently monotheistic, believing that there was only one God. And anyone claiming to be God was rightly charged with blasphemy. But here we see a Jewish authors claiming that Jesus, a real historical person, was in the form of God. It's astonishing. And moreover, this high Christology, that's called, you know, the idea of calling Jesus God, didn't appear many decades or centuries as the myths about Jesus grew in their retelling. But right here in Philippians, only a couple of decades after Jesus' life, where Jews were venerating Jesus as God. So this is another reason that I don't believe that the New Testament is to be fabricated or invented. No Jew would ever claim a person, any human person, no matter how impressive he or she was, to be in the form of God. Modern atheists say, give me evidence for God. Well, the biblical authors believe that God had come in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, it also makes sense for Jesus to be God himself. Otherwise, the statement in the next line doesn't really make a great deal of sense. For he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. If Jesus didn't really have the divine essence, then he couldn't really be equal with God in any sense. So it really means that God considered that Jesus was, so it really means that Paul considered that Jesus really was God, but he didn't use his godness to his own advantage. So we have this astonishing statement that Jesus was, in his very nature, God. 
the supreme being of the universe, the highest of the high. But, by way of contrast, verse 7, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. God became a man. This is another extraordinary statement. Jesus, in nature God, gave up the entitlements of being God and became a human servant. He didn't use his omnipotence to avoid tiredness or suffering. He made himself nothing. The divine and pre-existent Christ did not regard the advantage of his deity as grounds to avoid the incarnation. Perhaps we've become too familiar with the idea of God becoming man for this not to seem strange. Because in the ancient world, the gods never came to earth. The gods were up there, people down here. Plato, the great philosopher, considered the flesh, the physical, the human, dirty and unspiritual. The gods were spiritual, important and the true essence of reality. And indeed the gods rarely cared, rarely cared for the interests of people on earth. Humans were unimportant slaves of the gods and humans made offerings to appease the gods. Yet Jesus became a human servant. He does what no ancient god would ever conceive to become a human slave. Yet not only did he become a dirty, smelly human, which was humiliating enough, but see what he did in verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself and died. He died on a cross. Crucifixion was the most shameful and the most brutal punishment of the ancient world. It was even worse than decapitation or being burned alive. And the Roman philosopher Seneca said that any other form of death was preferable to crucifixion. Yet Jesus mounted that cross, the most shameful death reserved for criminals, and Jesus willingly and obediently humbled himself. New Testament scholar Lynn Kohig said about this, she said, to hear that a Messiah, a great king, an important person was crucified would be nonsense to the Greek or the Roman ear. It couldn't make sense of it. In fact, Roman citizens were not crucified for that very reason. It was just so shameful. So for the gospel message to proclaim a crucified Lord, it upended the value system that the Romans held. There was an ancient piece of Roman graffiti discovered in Rome dating to around the year 200. And this is the graffiti here. It's, it's sort of just made a bit clearer on the right there, but that's the graffiti on the left. And the graffiti shows a young man worshipping a crucified donkey-headed figure with this inscription, Alex Eminos worships his God. It's most likely that this graffiti was written to mock a Christian, a Christian man named Alex Eminos worshipping Jesus the one crucified on a cross. For the Romans being crucified is equivalent to being a donkey, a fool, an idiot. This graffiti shows just how shameful crucifixion was. And it's a joke that someone would worship the foolish crucified donkey. So Jesus, who is in the very form of God, let go his entitlements, took on the form of a servant, the form of a man, and humiliated himself by death, death on a cross, just like a foolish donkey. This was humiliating. Jesus' name, the name of his family, the name of everything he stood for, was humiliated, defiled, and made disgusting. The truly humble people had gone from some so the truly humble people had gone from somewhere lofty, giving up privilege and prestige and entitlements to embrace something more lowly, something less privileged. And Jesus went from the most extreme heights possible to the lowest low. God himself, the universe's supreme being, to a human, to a humiliating death on a cross. This is the ultimate example of humility. Jesus, though mighty, humbled himself by becoming a human slave and dying on a cross. But it doesn't end there. 
Because verses 9 to 11 say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So after his incarnation and humiliation by death on a cross, God exalts Jesus to the highest place and of authority over all the powers of all the rulers and forces of all creation. Downtrodden, suffering, dead and humiliated no longer through Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, he is given honour, glory and is given the name above all names, every name, so that ultimately, eventually, when Jesus returns, everyone will acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Now it's not clear that his exaltation is specifically Jesus' reward for suffering and dying on a cross, but exaltation is his ultimate destination. Indeed, the theme of raising up and exalting the humble and downtrodden is one that's throughout the whole Bible. For example, young Mary, when she discovers that she'll be the mother of Jesus, sings in Luke 1.52, He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2 said, The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. Or even, as we said before, the Pharisee and the tax collector, proud Bill, sorry, proud Peter and Shonky Bill, the tax collector in Luke 18, 15, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So here in Philippians, we have the one who was humbled most acutely, a man, Jesus, who dies a shameful death on a cross, is exalted to the highest place and is honoured with the greatest name. A name and a presence so great that every knee shall bow, the ultimate expression of respect, honour and deference to a superior. Now in the 2012 Avengers movie, the evil supervillain Loki demands that people bow down before him. He says, is this not the truth that humanity craves subjugation? Loki believed that the supreme lord of the universe entitled him to expect that people will bow down before him. Yet people won't bow down to Jesus because they, they're craving subjugation. People will bow down because he has been exalted so highly, so magnificently, that with such majesty that there is no other choice. When Peter, Jesus' disciple, saw something, a glimpse of Jesus' power and glory, he fell to his knees and said, Go away from me. Lord, I am a sinful man. He fell to his knees. And this occurred before Jesus had been exalted. So now just consider how the presence of this glorious, magnificent, exalted Christ will be, over, over, will be overpowering and the force overwhelming, that there will be no choice for everyone to kneel, express honour and to express submission of this mighty leader. Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, and even Donald Trump will bow the knee before Jesus. It's remarkable that this Jesus of Nazareth, some carpenter's son from a backwater of an obscure part of the Roman Empire, will be Lord of the universe, the one all will bow the knee to. But remember that Jesus wasn't just a carpenter's son. For he was in very nature God. So effectively Jesus returns to where he starts. Equal with God the Father. And hence this passage is described a giant V. Jesus who is in the form or in the essence of God. Humbles himself by becoming a servant. A man dying on a cross. And then he is exalted back to glory appropriate for his nature with a glorious name and given the name and prestige that belongs to God alone. For in the Old Testament, the only character for whom it was appropriate to, for every knee to bow is the Lord himself. And this idea is found in Isaiah 45, where, turn to me and be saved, where the Lord says, turn to me and be saved, all of you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. 
By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. So for Jews in the Old Testament, the Lord alone is the one whom people give honour and to, to honour to and before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue swear. Yet here in Philippians, this action of bowing the knee is actually given to Jesus, a man. This would be blasphemous if it wasn't actually God himself and it helps us see further that God really did, sorry, that Paul really did believe Jesus to be God. For what is promised for him is only appropriate for God alone. Jesus Christ, the righteous Saviour, bears the name of the one Lord, Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. This is truly an astonishing message in this passage. It's audacious. It's crazy. It's blasphemous. But it brings hope if you're suffering for the name of Jesus. Remember the Philippians were suffering for their faith. It was tough for them to bear the name of Jesus. And even as for us today in secular Australia, it might feel tough to be a Christian. It might feel unfair to be ostracised or criticised for believing in Jesus. It's hard to suffer for your faith. But if you are with Jesus, we will be on the right side of history. We will be on the winning team. We are united with the one who will be exalted above every name and will be the supreme leader of the universe a name that may cause ridicule and suffering today a name that is a swear word for many but is the name that will be exalted above every other name so be encouraged live for jesus live with him for you are on the right side of history he will be exalted and everyone will have to acknowledge him so who is the most humble leader ever? Well, I'd say it's clearly not Donald Trump. Despite his claims, he's hardly a humble man. In fact, someone said about Donald Trump that there is no better example of insecurity, exaggerated self-importance and egocentricity than Donald Trump. He's a man full of pride who used his high office not to serve the lowly, but that would appear perhaps to further his resume and his own business interests. So who is the most humble leader? Well, it's hard not to be impressed by President um, Mujica of Uruguay, the world's poorest president. He was very humble, yet he was originally a farmer. And so in some sense, he, was, he started low, was elevated, only to lower himself back to his original status. Yet Jesus shows even more remarkable humility, for he was the highest of the high. He was God himself in his very essence. But he lowered himself to, be, to die on a shameful Roman cross. The ultimate example of humility. Now Vladimir Putin wears a cross. But he's hardly a humble man. He doesn't seem to realise what the cross symbolises. For the cross of Jesus symbolises the greatest act of humiliation of humility, that God should come to die for his people, for their sins. The cross is a constant reminder of the ultimate example of humility, that Jesus Christ, someone so lofty, would give up his privilege, give up the entitlements of being God to serve, to become a man and to die on a cross. And so with this magnificent poem, Paul encourages the believers to have this mind, this attitude, the mind and attitude of Christ. Now, a number of years ago, I used to go to a church where we needed to put out the chairs each week. We hired a space and the furniture needed to be moved each week. Anyway, each Sunday, the pastor of the church was there first, putting out the, putting out the chairs. And one day, a new member of the church turned up, who was also happened to be a lecturer at a nearby theological college, and he offered to serve. He said, well, I can help you put out the chairs. The minister responded, the pastor responded by saying, no, no, I can't have you put out chairs. Your gifts will be much better utilised in other ways. And the lecturer responded, quick as a flash, yes, 
I'm sure your gifts could be used better as well. The chairs need to be put out. Let me help. That's service in the mind of Christ, isn't it? Not viewing yourself too highly, not doing a job beneath you, living, following a humble servant. Now, I'm not just saying that so that we can fill rosters or get people to, to serve or to do the morning tea or whatever. That would be d- deeply manipulative. But I'm saying it because humble service is actually at the heart of the Christian life. We are to, to put on the apron of humility because Jesus wore the cross of humility. But the good news is that Jesus didn't stay dead. The humble cross didn't win. Jesus is alive. And so exaltation is coming. Glory is approaching. Jesus will be exalted to the highest place. And for those of us in Christ, as Jesus says about Shonky Bill, or the tax collector in Luke, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Suffering and difficulty now, but glory is coming when Jesus will be known as God and every knee will bow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example and inspiration of Jesus, that though he is in the very nature of God, he did not use this to his own advantage, but became a servant, a human, and he died on a cross for our sins. Yet we also know that Jesus has been raised and exalted to the highest place. So, Father, may this knowledge give us hope and motivation to continue to stand for you amidst opposition and difficulty. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Please be seated. Philippians 2 says that after Jesus humbled himself, um, then after, after Jesus humbled himself, Philippians 2 says, Therefore God exalted him, the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, may we go from here remembering our union with Christ, comforted by his love, empowered by our sharing in your spirit, And may we live lives worthy as your citizens, remembering always the mighty exaltation and humility of Jesus our Lord. And may we always remember and have the mind and the attitude of Christ to your glory. Amen. Well, it's been great that you can join us with us this morning. Uh, It's terrific. Uh, Now, I think the morning tea, I think, is going to be served again by the youth. I think I saw them coming through. And so I think they're over there. There's there's a bit of movement in the kitchen. So please stick stick around for some some refreshments and some opportunity to chat. Say hello to someone you perhaps haven't talked to for a while. But it's great to see you. And next week, we'll be back. Even though I think it's the, the long weekend next week. And so I'm not sure with the Melbourne Cup coming up as well. But we'll still be here as we continue our journey through the book of Philippians. So have a great week and look forward to seeing you next time.